it's Melissa, Community Garden Coordinator for Duke Farms Community Garden. I hope that you guys can hear me and see me okay. Um, I am just so happy to be talking without a mask uh, this evening. It's lovely. And um, I'm actually here tonight in my own home garden, um, just down the road from Duke in Hillsborough, New Jersey. Hi, Nora. Um, so I hope you guys can comment and throw me a few likes if you're out there. I guess you can wave. I don't know. I've never done this before. Um, so we're going to do our best. Um, I guess how this works is I, um, I thought back in the spring when we were doing some like Zoom programming, we did a program um, through Zoom that I ended with question and answer session and there were so many just general questions and answers. I think this year because people were quarantined and at home and maybe nervous about food supply that um, they turned to gardening, which is wonderful. Uh, it's really interesting actually, there was a uh, global, I don't know if it was global, but a, a large shortage of tomato cages because so many new people were gardening and it was really hard to come by like little starts and seeds were sold out. Um, and I, I think these are all really great things. So I love that that's happening. I've taught a lot of classes to brand new gardeners this year. So I hope some of you are out there. Um, shoot me a thumbs up and um, we're gonna get started. So like I said, I'm in my home garden and I wanted to give you kind of a little tour. I'm gonna walk around and show you some of the things that's going on in my garden, some of the great things that I love some of the things that I'm um, really disappointed. I think gardening is just one really huge experiment. And um, if you're not experimenting every single year, I think you're, it's a missed opportunity. So definitely as you learn, repeat the things that you learn, but um, you know, try new things every year, try new locations and designs and um, you know, whatever it is that you're thinking about. New crops every single year, um, some that you're gonna love, some that you're gonna hate, and, um, and that's the most fun part about it. Right now, it is mid-July. It is so tremendously hot outside. Um, the sun is just starting to set over my fence, which is good because it was really hot out here before. Um, and at this point, even though we're just dying of heat, it's actually a great time to start thinking about your fall garden. And so as some of the summer crops start to wane and go away, um, you can start thinking about what you're going to replace them with and what the timing is. That's kind of a question some people have. So um, definitely if you have a question of something that you see or something I say, chime in. I can kind of see people's comments. So that's really fun. So we're going to walk and we're going to go take a look. I think, how do I flip this? I think I can flip it like this so you don't have to look at me. So hopefully I don't trip while I'm walking. Okay, I want to point out this bed right here. Can you guys hear me when this camera is flipped? Everybody okay? All right, hopefully that's working. Okay, this garden bed right here. First of all, maybe I'll give you like a little like panoramic of my garden. Um, this is a brand new fence, not that fence over there. Let me go back. I don't want to make anybody dizzy. This fence over here, we were sort of bored um, in quarantine. We kind of had an old dilapidated fence. So I called the lumber company, local lumber company. They were able to deliver. Um, and we had some old wo woven wire fencing that we were able to repurpose. And so we, we dug some holes and built this brand new fence. And I just love it. We actually moved some of the garden beds. So you can see over near the, um, like sort of over here near that privacy fence, there were some garden beds over there and they were actually starting to get shaded out because when the sun, at this point, you can see how shaded it is. Um, the sun was actually shading some of those beds that were over there and it was a lot of water down where that wheelbarrow is. Um, so we decided to um, move some of those beds. So that's what we kind of did in the spring, which was really fun. So again, always be rethinking your garden. Okay, so back here, this bed actually um, was where my garlic was. And so garlic, for those of you who are not familiar, I highly recommend planting garlic, even if you're a brand new gardener, one of the most easy crops to grow. Um, you plant it in the fall, usually right around um, like beginning of October to mid-October. Some people plant it in January. Um, you can kind of, it's very flexible, but you cannot plant it in the spring. So you need to think now about where your garlic is gonna go in your garden, sort of find a space. Um, once I pull my garlic, it comes out usually right around 4th of July every year. 
um, and I pull it out. It's curing in the garage right now. It's probably ready to be trimmed and stored away and it lasts for many, many months. Um, and this crop here is called buckwheat. Um, this is a cover crop and it's super easy to grow. You buy the seed, basically just kind of, I usually, you know, aerate the soil just a little bit. Um, and then I sprinkle the buckwheat right on top. I water it in maybe twice. It sprouts up within the first couple days. Um, and then you have this lovely cover crop of buckwheat, which is in, in the legume family. It is a nitrogen fixer um, and it does scavenge nutrients from your soil. So cover crops are a great way to sort of um, invigorate your soil while you're not using it. This crop particularly loves the midsummer heat, it grows really fast in about four weeks. Um, it's ready to turn in right into the soil. I usually just grab a, a sharp hoe or shovel, just chop it right into the soil, wait a day or two, um, and then plant right into it. So if I say I was gonna plant in this bed some fall crops, some carrots or some cabbages or some turnips, um, that would be where I'd plant them right into here. And you just have to kind of figure out the timing. Over here, I have some broccoli going on. Um, you can see there's some leaf damage on this broccoli. And so part of the um, reason for this program is I just wanted to demonstrate no matter how long you've been gardening, you're always going to have some things that kind of get away from you and cause you stress and strife. So there are several insects that damage brassica crops, which are broccolis, cabbages, especially. Um, in this bed, it probably was a combination of cabbage moth, which lay their eggs on the leaves, and then they get a little green worm. I should have looked to see if I could find one. Um, and they will eat the leaf, but I think also what I have in here um, is another bug called, I think it's called a harlequin, um, harlequin bug. I saw one in here the other day, um, and it's munching on the leaves as well. However, um, I did spray these with BT, which is um, an organic, um, not even really a chemical, BT is actually a natural bacteria, um, and that helps to deter the chewing. So I wanted to show you sort of my baby broccoli that's starting to emerge. I want to make sure. So there it is. Little tiny broccoli coming up. It's a little late this year and these plants are definitely spaced close together. Way closer than they should be um, and that's probably why they're a little bit later. So you can find um, the days to maturity on the seed packet of the variety that you grow and learn about how fast your uh, whatever crop it is will come to maturity. But it, obviously it varies on the um, the weather and all sorts of things like that. Um, this is a new crop that I tried this year, this bright green, green down here in the corner. This is radicchio. And as many of you who have eaten radicchio, um, no, it's supposed to be red. I have no idea. Mine is not turning red. It's not forming a head. Um, and I can't figure out why. I've done some research and I found out that maybe it likes the cooler weather. So I actually cut it back like this crop right here. I cut back, let's see if you can see. Um, you can barely even tell. I cut the whole thing off, these two, and I wanted to see if then they would um, form a head and turn into real radicchio. So far, they're just still really green. They're super bitter because of the heat. Um, so I've just kind of been composting them, but uh, I'm not really sure. That's one of those experiments that I'm not really thrilled with. I have some younger broccoli that I started a little bit later. Um, so as broccoli will grow, it'll develop one central head and then It'll develop a lot of side shoots, but I thought maybe I'll have a second crop of broccoli that goes on um, in that crop. Um, over here, this is my girl Merida, my little chicken. Uh, we have a flock of 10 backyard chickens. I love them to death. They're my favorite things ever. Merida wasn't doing so well, so we brought her over to this side of the yard away from the rest of the flock to try to recover. And I think she's really liking it. She kind of thinks she's a human. Um, sweet potatoes. So this um, is another crop I really recommend to people that um, are new gardeners. It's a really fun crop. And this, these I planted in a planter, uh, that large metal guy. And then I have these potato bags over, over here. Um, so this is also sweet potato. And these potato bags are from Gardener's Supply. Um, and they're fantastic. I grow potatoes in them at the community garden with my junior gardeners. They make life so easy because at the end of the season, you just literally turn them over, dump them out, um, and then you can pick your potatoes right out of them. So I figured, let me try that at home. They're growing really nicely. You can see they're a vine, they spread around, they climb around, they're really quite ornamental actually. So I'm really enjoying them. This is a regular potato um, that's in this bed. 
uh, this bag, I should say. So this is a fingerling potato and um, that guy is growing in a bag in the same exact, this is what I mean about, I'm always experimenting. Um, so that's fingerling and then this one over here, same potato in the ground. So I'm interested, I know exactly how many seed pieces I put in the ground and in the um, bag and I want to see which one does better. So that's kind of a fun little experiment. I find that growing plants in containers um, is more difficult even in those bags because you have to be a little bit more vigilant with watering. Um, and in the ground, you can be much more flexible because the roots can reach down into the ground and find whatever it is they look for. Oh, I have a question. Yes, Susan, the potato bags are definitely reusable. I do not wash them, though that's a good question. Maybe if, maybe we should be washing them. I don't really know. Um, sweet potatoes don't have a whole lot of insects, so it wouldn't be, or pathogens that would live in the soil. And you're basically dumping out the soil somewhere in your garden, maybe in your compost or in like another flower bed or something. Um, and then you're using fresh soil each year. So I don't think you would need to wash them, um, but certainly you could. I would rather probably just rinse them out and then leave them in the sun to solarize. Um, but yeah, they'll last for a good good long time. They're kind of a really heavy canvas. Um, and again, those are from Gardener Supply. And I, I can't remember, I think they're maybe 25 or $30 a piece. Uh, I have some other potatoes. So for those of you that have never grown potatoes, sometimes you'll, if you are growing them and you come out and you see them, sort of looking like mine are looking, you might be concerned um, that there was an insect or that there was some damage because there are potato um, bugs and blight and things like that. But this is just the natural cycle of potatoes. So once they grow underground, they start to brown up and then they'll eventually die all the way to the ground. You can start harvesting them at any point after they flower. They form usually like a purple or a white flower um, and you can start pulling out new potatoes. Some people grow a specific like crop just of new potatoes, those little tiny baby ones. Um, but these guys, I'm gonna let them go. These taller ones are Yukon Gold right here. And then the shorter ones, like I said, are the Fingerling. Um, you do have to do a lot of digging. Um, and if you miss any though, next year they'll probably regrow and you get some extra potatoes, which is kind of a fun thing. I've always wanted to try to um, plant potatoes in the fall and see if they'll just grow the next year. Um, okay, so I have a couple questions here. When do you stop watering the potato plant in the bag? Um, you can water them right up until they really start to die. So I've been still watering this guy because it's still definitely photosynthesizing and growing. Once it starts to really start die back, I'll stop watering them. And then eventually I'll either pull the, um, you know, dump it out and pull the potatoes or you can let it die all the way down to the ground and let them kind of cure in there for a little bit. Um, and then they last a little bit longer in storage, but you really, if you're growing a potato bag, you're not getting that much. So you don't necessarily have to store them that long. Um, they are from Gardener Supply, like I said, gardenersupply.com. So it's an online company. Um, when do you pick the sweet potatoes? Great question. So the sweet potatoes, I usually pick right before the frost. Um, they do not like the frost. So I usually watch my calendar, watch the weather, I should say. Our average first frost date here in Hillsboro in zone 6B is right around October 15th. Um, so I look for the weather. Once it's about to frost, I usually pull out all the vines, which the vines are edible, by the way, and they taste like spinach. Um, you can cook them up. I wouldn't, I've never eaten them raw, but I have cooked them and put them like into eggs and soups. Um, and they're really healthy, delicious um, green. Um, and then you just gotta dig, 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 unless you're growing them in a bag, of course, where you just dump them out. Um, and then you do have to go through a curing process. Um, where you let them sort of sit at a warmish temperature inside your house um, and that hardens up the skin. Um, and once the skin um, is cured, then they'll last literally the whole winter. So I've grown, and it, this this metal bucket plus these other two, I'll probably have close to 100 pounds of sweet potatoes. Like they are really prolific. Um, and I usually store them right in my house and um, use them all winter long. You do have to hill regular potatoes and the reason for hilling um, is just simply to prevent the potatoes from being exposed to the sun. So sun actually turns potatoes green. We call it a potato sunburn. Um, and that you don't want, it gets, makes the potatoes really bitter. It's slightly poisonous, but I don't think it's really a problem for like eating. You know, you might in your um, potato chip bag see a green potato chip every once in a while. So um, what I did was I added 
Um, I don't have a lot of extra soil to add to my garden bed here. So I actually do a pretty shallow, I plant them probably four to five inches deep, you know, maybe like one like spade worth. I stick the little seed potato in there. Um, once they start to grow and they get to be five or six inches, usually what I do is add a bunch of um, leaf compost. So I save leaves from the fall. I go around town and collect leaves. It's super fun. And um, I'll add like a bag or two of leaves on top of these. And then they kept growing. And as you can see, I added a layer of straw. So I don't really add any soil to my bed. Um, and that's okay because you really just want to protect them from the sun. The bag one, I did plant them probably right um, at the very bottom, like only a couple inches above the, I filled it with probably, you know, a couple inches of soil, planted the seed potatoes, and then added some more. And I did buy some bagged soil for that one. Um, potato bugs. I hate potato bugs. They're awful. I don't really have potato bugs at my house. I, I see one every once in a while and I'm so grateful for that because at the community garden there's like a bazillion. Um, and potato bugs are actually not that hard to manage. Um, I'm going to show you a cucumber beetle in a minute and those are way worse. Um, a potato bug. The adults are like a really giant beetle and um, they're really easy to pick up and squish. They are not doing the damage to your potatoes though. The, what's doing the damage are the nymphs. And so it's well past nymph season. You don't have to worry about it. But next year, you're going to look for these tiny red sort of chubby, um, disgusting grub like creatures. Um, and sometimes there can be a lot. They, they're very easy to hand pick though or squish. You know, hire a kid, pay them an ice cream cone or something to either pick them off and pop them into a container of soapy water or just squish them right there on the vine. You can use a product called Surround, which is basically like a clay and you mix it into water and make a slurry and you can spray the plants down and um, it deters the potato beetles from munching on the, um, on the vines. You just have to reapply it when it rains. It's not a chemical, it just basically prevents them from eating. I actually use that on a lot of stuff. I use it on my um, cucumbers um, and so forth. So uh, cooking the sweet potato vines, just like spinach. I just basically like, I usually use the newest leaves, you know, down here that are really lovely and green, um, clip them off. And then you basically treat them like spinach. Give them a rinse, saute them up with some garlic, put them in your eggs, um, whatever. Okay, what's the difference between bag soil and regular soil? So I consider this soil in the ground here, like my natural native brown soil, which here in uh, Somerset County, we have super high clay content, but I love this soil. And I'm a big fan of people using the soil that you have and just sort of amending it with compost. Bag soil is really just sand that has some compost in it. Um, it doesn't have quite as high a nutrient level as the clay soil does. So I definitely, um, if you're gonna be building new garden beds, um, use the soil that you have. So these are raised beds. I'll talk just really briefly. This lumber is a two by eight lumber that I use. They are four, no, I'm sorry, probably three and a half foot by eight foot beds. Um, and I have about 12, 13, 14. I don't know, I lost count. I keep building beds. Um, and what we did was we took the regular ground soil and really just amended it. We turned it up, most of this by hand with pitchfork and um, have at, have been adding compost. I've added a little bit of um, topsoil from the nursery to supplement, um, but most, but definitely it helps to keep your native soil here. This is a cucumber plant I wanted to show you. So I am obsessed with pickle cucumbers because they tend to resist cucumber beetles a little bit better than the regular slicers, and I think they're delicious. But I'm going to show you what happens if you don't pick them every single day. I just saw this guy in here. Let me see if I can get it. Like, so this, if you don't come out here every day, you end up with these ginormous sort of swollen. You can tell when a cucumber is overripe because it gets this yellowish tinge. It just looks kind of a little bit bloated. Um, my chickens love, you can still eat this, but it, it's like a little bit overripe. But this is what it should like. These are called Nash, uh, no, these are called homemade pickles, cucumbers. And I, they're my favorite variety. So I just actually made some pickles the other day. We had about six or seven pounds of um, pickling cucumbers. And I love bread and butter pickles. So that's what we made. Okay, let's see. I wanted to show you, oh, Merida ate my, I, had, I found a cucumber beetle and I squished it and left it here. And of course she ate it. 
Uh, that's okay. Um, I want to show you the damage. So this right here, this is the damage from cucumber beetle. Um, they're really tiny, um, little like yellow and they look kind of like a yellowish ladybug. I, I'll never be able to find one right now. Um, but what they do is they chew and they hide in the flowers a lot of times. So if you look in a flower, you might be able to find one. Um, they love, oh, here's one right here. Let me see if we can, let's see if we can zoom in on that little bugger. Can you see him in there? See, he's just hanging out. That's a striped cucumber beetle. They also have spotted cucumber beetles and I hate them. So where'd he go? Oh, he just flew away immediately. I couldn't even get him. Um, now I'm zoomed in and I can't zoom out. Ah, okay, here we go. Um, anyway, so they go in there, they, they do some like pollination and then they chew, they chew on your leaves. So if you direct seed a cucumber seed and then it gets hammered by cucumber beetles, you got a dead plant almost immediately. And they love pumpkins, they love melon, they love anything in that cucurbit family with the yellow flower. Um, so it's not good. So I usually start those things inside so I get a good head start. And then when I put them out in the garden, I actually cover them with row cover till they get really robust. Because when they're this size, they can resist the cucumber chewing pretty well. But then what the other thing they do is they transmit a virus called bacterial wilt virus. And this is what that looks like. You see this leaf? Um, so this is what the start of that looks like. You'll start seeing dead pieces here. And then I remember the first time that I saw this, um, in my garden, I thought the cucumber plant needed water. Um, and I watered it and watered it and the next day it was just like flat to the ground. Um, so there's the name wilt virus. Um, and it's, it's unavoidable. You can buy plants that are resistant to it, but I tend to think these, um, pickling cucumbers tend to do pretty well. Pumpkins don't seem to succumb to the wilt virus as much, but I want to show you another nemesis in the garden because that's sort of the time of year for that. This is what I found today. Yesterday, this plant was perfectly beautifully healthy and I was just about to harvest. I'm gonna show you, this is called a Ronde zucchini. And look how cute this is. I mean, look at that guy. He's like, you're supposed to harvest them when they're about just a little bigger than a golf ball. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with this. I anticipated there being a lot more on the plant it's not doing, it wasn't ever really growing that well. And now it's completely dead. And that is not from bacterial wilt, but that is from, now I don't know if I'll be able to find it. Um, let's see if I can flip this. Can you see the chewing in there, right there? This is from a squash vine borer. This plant, looks pretty healthy today. Tomorrow it'll be dead because there we can, you can see what they do. So squash vine borer is a moth and um, I want to see if I can get them out of there because sometimes sometimes we can get them out and I can show you um, it's a moth and it lays its eggs at the base of the squash plant, buries in there and just basically bores up the center of it. And if you find it before it's dead, you can slice it out and actually heal the squash over. The squash will root right from the stem. Um, so you can actually take out the grub, which I'm not seeing. Sometimes you open up the stem and you can find a giant grub. This guy might have already moved on. Like I might have missed him. A I mean, he might have been here a while ago. Um, anyway, they're gross and I hate them. Um, and I missed that one. But I did just plant a second baby zucchini. So there it is popping up over there. Um, and that one will take over for these two dying zucchini. So it's good to kind of plant zucchini in a um, succession. I've got some onions over here. Onions are not quite ready yet. They're still standing nice and tall. The way you can tell an onion is ready is they start to flop over. Um, but you can of course harvest them at any time. I have a combination of red and white onions in here. Um, 
and they kind of perch above the ground a little bit you can see so we've been eating them fresh we've been pickling them a little bit and then eventually i will pull them out um and cure them and then they will last all winter long okay i had a tiny bug that came up through the stem and ate the flowers of my zucchinis was told you can't kill them. So did it climb? Hmm. Through the stem. I'm not sure what that is. Um, the only so the squash basically have three insects that bug it out. One is the squash vine borer that I just talked about. One is the cucumber beetle, and one is the squash bug. A squash bug looks sort of like a uh, stink bug. It's in that same family, and those are really tricky um, to manage as well. This bed um, is really doing amazing. This is my pepper bed. Um, and for those of you that have taken classes with me, we actually, we did like a transplant class and this was the actual plant that we planted during that transplant class. And look at these peppers. I mean, this is like stunning. I mean, there's so many peppers in here. I don't even know what to say. This is a variety called Olympus and the seeds are a little bit expensive, um, but I'm so obsessed with them. They're, they're really nice and blocky and um, just, my kids say they taste like supermarket um, peppers, which is quite a compliment. Um, these are some jalapenos. So I usually do one jalapeno a year. This is like way more than I'm ever gonna eat, but jalapenos freeze um, really lovely. You just kind of chop them up and flash freeze them and leave them um, there and I can use them all winter long. I, you can do that with regular peppers too. So I usually eat the fresh peppers all summer. They will, all peppers will turn color. They will usually turn red unless there are different varieties. So they could turn orange or brown or purple, um, but without th that being indicated on the package, they will always turn red even jalapenos will turn, will turn red. Um, so once they turn red, they should be picked. And then if you're not going to eat them, they can easily be frozen. We have some kind of crazy Thai chilies out here. I think they're hiding. I'm not sure. Oh, here's some kind of, I don't know what these are. My husband, oh, I just picked one. Oh, shoot. Well, we'll try that up. I think these, you fry them up. I don't know. We have like, we tried like six or seven various kinds of Kind of crazy peppers this year um in this bed i'm really happy with it's growing super lush um oh the clips good question okay so these peppers they were getting a little tall so i don't love to use like wooden stakes because i feel like they're just gonna rot and transfer disease so we use rebar let's see if we can see it um this is just a piece of I don't know, probably half inch rebar that you get from Lowe's. It's a couple bucks. I have a whole um, stash of them that I can use for various things. These are like electrical clips. They're a couple bucks each. They sell them in the tool department. Um, I don't exactly know um, what they're for uh, in the electricity world, but I love them. I use them to, for this purpose. We use them for um, holding row cover down. Like, so if we use um, a hoop, we'll, we'll use the little clips. Um, over that to hold them on so those are kind of a fun and again just like sort of having a tool shed of um of this sort of stuff that you can um you can call upon when you need it um yeah maybe these are shishito peppers i know we did plant shishito um so maybe that's what they are thank you do you know what to do with them if you have eaten them before give me a recipe i think we're gonna fry them i'm not really sure what do you think meredith she's not sure either all right, so I have some celery um, in this bed. Celery, I've never been super happy with. It looks very lush and lovely right now, but it's always a little bit bitter. I think I need to probably water it a little more. Let's see if we can get a visual. Here it is. So there is the celery head in there. And it's good, it's, it's much stronger than supermarket celery. So, um, it's okay. I'll probably freeze some of it and just use it in the summer. I'm not sure I like it for fresh eating, maybe for soups. This is my asparagus bed. It's getting a little away from me. It needs to get weeded and some asparagus has died. This thing is probably eight years old and I tried to transplant some. Don't ever do that because um, they didn't live. And lastly, in this corner, tomatoes, which are starting to turn red. How amazing. This one is, someone recommended this variety. It's called Cordova. 
oh my god look at all those green tomatoes that's like a sauce tomato and they said it was just super prolific but it's a determinant tomato i don't usually grow determinant um but i tried it this year um then of course i have my san marzano my go-to um and then a few other varieties i plant about eight tomatoes in this um bed so they're each about two feet apart um and then there's two rows of them tomatoes need some good spacing we're doing some grape tomatoes this year so those are always the first one to be ripe um these are some parsnips i love parsnips in the winter um oh so i want to talk about fall planting before i f close up for the evening um so this bed this is a brassica bed i planted in the spring um and i've been harvesting out of it there's kales there's cabbages that were planted probably in may late may i think um and kohlrabi if you guys haven't tried kohlrabi that's another fun one i love it it's it's kind of has a really mild cabbagey flavor but it's a really nice addition to salads um, i like to start it inside first even though the directions say to direct sow it i have much better luck with it being inside first um so my cabbages are kind of taking a while to grow these are red express cabbage um but hopefully they they're probably sad because it's so hot out just like the rest of us um, but what I have going on is under the row cover up there, I have some new crops. And so I want to talk a little bit about how you plan for your fall garden. So the crops that you want to grow in the fall garden are very similar to the ones that you grow in the spring garden. So cabbages, kohlrabis, um, you can do kale, you can do broccoli, carrots, beets, like there's tons of stuff. The fall garden is actually my favorite garden because, um, it, is so much cooler um, and you sort of get a second chance at doing a whole bunch of stuff um, and so the way that you determine the timing of it it's pretty easy you have to know your first frost date and like i said here in zone 6b we are october 15th is our approximately first frost date um, and then what you do is you look at your seed packet and you or your whatever crop it is and you have to subtract the days to maturity so a cabbage, like a Red Express cabbage, um, takes about 65 days to maturity, okay? So what you do, usually tack on about 10 days for the fall planting, because there's waning light um, and it'll grow a little bit more slowly. So that's about 75 days, right? A month is about 60 days. So you're gonna go about two and a half months from October 15th. So you want to try to get these plants in the ground by the beginning of August. That's gonna give them about 75 days to grow so that by the time the nights start getting really cold and the daylight is getting shorter and shorter, they are mature. Now they are not going to die when the frost hits. So my cabbages and kales and lettuces and things like that, they're gonna be fine out here. Sometimes, I mean, they're fine like even under snow, um, but they are not really growing anymore. They're gonna start growing really slowly. So if you're waiting for that head of cabbage, um, and you have a really small cabbage, it's not gonna get to maturity and then you're gonna end up wasting it. So definitely for the larger crops, broccoli, cabbages, like I said, Brussels sprouts, you can plant them all. I aim for the last week of June, first week of August. The problem is for some reason the nurseries don't have them available at that time. They have them a little bit later. Um, so we can bug our nurseries a little bit about that. But um, I start them inside, it's a little tricky. Um, to start them outside because it's so hot. Uh, so I start them under the lights and then they're ready to go. And then there's, and there's carrots and daikon radish, regular radish, things like that, that can also be direct seeded. Um, and then you can do stuff into September. So lettuces, spinach, regular radish, um, arugula, any of the mixed baby greens, they can all be done September, even into the first week in October because they grow so quickly um and you will get a good harvest so what i like to do now at this time of year is kind of take stock of my garden see what's growing um see what's doing well out here and what's not um and then try to start to sketch what i want to put in there um next week and then what i what i want to um put in through september and then where my garlic is going to go super important i dedicate one whole eight foot bed to um my garlic each year so thank you guys for joining me. It's finally, it's still probably 85 degrees out here and I'm sweating. I need a cold drink of water. Um, thank you for the recipe. So I am going to, ooh, I like the idea of feta on there. Um, if you're interested in more of these sort of garden chats, 
um, and tours, I am happy to do them. Maybe um, at a time when we're getting ready to plant some stuff or if there's any specific topics you guys want to know about, feel free to comment after the video is over and I can catch up with you guys later. So thank you so much and have a lovely evening. Take care.